In 1989 in Brooklyn, New York, a baby girl was born already addicted to crack cocaine, her mother having abused the drug throughout her pregnancy. Taken in by her loving father, she was given the chance of a happy life. But following his untimely death, this opportunity was snatched away when the courts placed her back into the custody of her abusive, drug-addicted mother. A Cinderella story without the happy ending. It would prove to be one of the worst cases of child abuse in New York's history. This is what happens when a vulnerable child is tortured by those who should love her most and failed by a system that should protect her. This is the murder of Elisa Izquierdo. Now, for those of you who come here all the time, you know I'm an absolute true crime obsessive, which is why I absolutely love Magellan TV. I am becoming more and more obsessed with Magellan TV. Why? Because it has so many crime shows that I've never seen before. They just seem to have this exhaustive amount. I watched How to Spot a Cult this week. Now, for those of you who know me, you'll also know that I love researching cult areas. And this was amazing because it kind of dissects, firstly, how people become invested, interested, intrigued with the area of belongingness, and also, of course, how these charismatic leaders often turn into real malevolent beings, but in such a gradual way that if you happen to be involved in what they are saying and getting involved in actually becoming part of their community, it's really hard for you to even notice. And it covers the tactics and awful realities of the impacts of people who end up feeling that they've been betrayed by these leaders. And also, of course, the most important part of this, when it leads ultimately to the downfall and death of individuals who have joined these kind of communities. So if you are interested, I would certainly recommend this particular show. Just to let you know, if you don't know what Magellan TV is, it's incredible. It adds 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week. So true crime fans will never run out of something to watch. And essentially you can get a month for free. That's right. You can take advantage of my special offer in the link in the video description so that you can watch my recommended documentary that I've just given you and the rest of Magellan TV's extensive true crime collection. Like I said, the best thing about Magellan TV is new documentaries like this are literally added every single week. You will get a one month free trial by clicking on the link in the description. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. You've asked for this particular case a lot and I'm aware that because I have a real connection with child murder and child abuse because of my work that I do do a lot of cases that involve children so I often try to mix them up. This has been one that I have researched and that has really affected me. I am stunned that I'm going to have to tell this story today. I feel like I'm always stunned when I'm telling a story of systemic failures because it's so blindly obvious where the end will be in these cases, and they're always negative. And this case of Elisa Ikiado absolutely highlights that reality. Just wanna say thanks to all of you who are returning. Thank you for those of you who subscribe, those of you who write comments, those of you who like the material and content, even when it's difficult to like, because it's a conflict. How do we like this kind of content when it's talking about the most horrific things that happen? But nonetheless, it supports my channel and I appreciate every single one of you. Massive shout out to my YouTube and Patreon subs. Thank you. This is why I make this material because you create an opportunity for me to do so. You guys are unbelievable. Today's case is going to leave you rattled. It's going to leave you angry. I know a lot of you know this case because you've asked for it again and again and again. But hopefully you're going to know more about this case after I've told it than you already do. And that's probably going to result in you feeling even angrier than you believed you would, having known the contents of this previously. This case for me 
highlights every single issue that I have with the system. And I think that when you look at the golden potential and opportunities this little girl was afforded initially after the unfortunate beginning of her life, everything was there, every possibility to play for, every hopeful outcome possible, it was all there. And as far as I'm concerned, aside from the murderous excuse for a mother, it was the system that we're really gonna analyze as well today because it is the system that absolutely took that little girl to her murder. A Wilda Lopez, that's where we'll start. She was born in 1966. She grew up on the really tough streets of Brooklyn, New York City. She was one of 13 children. She had Puerto Rican origin. She was somebody that was described by people who knew her as very curious, very well adjusted. And her mother genuinely had really high hopes. She felt that she had the potential intellectually, socially, and also on a family level, because there was support there, to break free from the family's cycle of current poverty. But of course, no matter what you hope for for your children, often they go their own way. By the time that she's a teenager, her life is on a downward spiral. So first of all, she starts hanging around with really unhealthy influences. She's going around with a bad crowd. She really takes her focus off education and instead she puts focus onto the young men that she was interested in. And one particular man stood out and she decided that she was gonna have children with him. It's as simple as that. She was very fixated on connecting and keeping this guy. This guy's a girl called Ruben Rivera. So before long, she's got two children with him, Ruben, Chino and Casey. At this point, they all move into an apartment together on the infamous Knickerbocker Avenue. And we're not thinking about the title being resonant of the delicious dessert. No, it's not a place of fantasy and dreams. It's not a place where you would want to be because this is an area that's known where hard drugs are being widely used and readily available. So she kind of indulges herself from the moment she arrives there and before you long, she's hopelessly addicted to crack cocaine and it just comes to dominate her life. But it also, of course, starts to destroy the lives of those around her. And when you have two children, you have no right to be going out and getting cracked off your head because the reality is it's going to make you a terrible parent. And she was. Lopez was a terrible mother from the get-go. Any money that she received in benefits that were meant to be there to pay for her children and actually give them a life of nurture, helping them to thrive, that was not gonna happen. She just went and spent it on her prolific habit. And it seems that the only thing that she was really dedicated to was getting her next fix. And I appreciate that we all are aware that dependency is a horrible affliction and people become addicted to drugs and essentially lose sight of their responsibilities. But when you have kids, I just don't think you deserve that level of empathy because there are children who are suffering because of your actions. And for the most part, when it comes down to having children, you have to recognise that you are going to prioritise their needs and safeguard their needs above anybody else's, even if that's tough for you. And the truth is, not all dependents, in fact, a large majority of dependents, do not just totally disregard their children when they struggle. In fact, many are functional and many hide the dependency because they still want to provide care and attention for their kids. So we're not even going to lump people who are addicted to drugs into one category because there are many that will still prioritise their kids and secondarily then look after their habit. But that's not the case with this woman. She's absolutely prioritising her own needs. This is one of the most selfish people I'm going to describe, by the way. I was trying to think about a way that I could actually connect the dots regarding her personality. And we can use things like narcissist, we can use things like psychopath. There are always words that I think associate quite well in these contexts with these kind of characters. But I also just think that when you think about egocentricity and selfishness and an ego that is all about self-desire and self-want, she is that. Just the most entitled type of human being. She is 
genuinely one of the most atrocious people that I've ever discussed on my channel. Just putting it out there before I go any further. So when she's out scoring her crack, she usually leaves the kids with family friends. Often she'd leave them for days at a time. So she'd go off, she'd get wasted, and then she'd pick them up when she could be bothered. But in the end, that becomes too much hassle. So she just leaves them. She doesn't leave them with any adults. She just leaves them unattended, neglects them, remain in the apartment by themselves. Imagine how scared those children would be. I mean, I do suppose to some degree it could be also a sense of light relief because having this kind of human appendage that's just a waste of space in your space probably wouldn't give you a lot of comfort anyway. But the danger of leaving children unattended by themselves in an apartment, it speaks for itself. And she's absolutely happy to do that. Now, Lopez and her husband, they eventually start to struggle financially. Of course they do, because they are literally smoking all of their money. They're not thinking about actually paying rent. So they end up getting evicted from the property and then they end up on the streets, which is horrific when you think about the fact they've got children. The stress of this, I say, potentially, is why they separated, but I also think they were two pretty horrific human beings, and that's likely the reason why they decided to separate in the end, because they didn't really care for each other at all, nor for the children. They just wanted to share time having fixes of drugs, and when money became a big problem, and they needed to probably hustle and grind elsewhere to get the cash that they needed, they probably didn't consider themselves a connected couple. They just saw each other as as basically a drain on their drug money. So they separate. So this now means that obviously she needs to find housing and accommodation. And in 1987, while she's actually living in a homeless shelter with her two kids in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, Lopez ends up meeting Gustavo Izquierdo. And he's an immigrant from Cuba. And sliding doors moments, if only he had not met her, genuinely. This is a guy who'd come to America in 1980, hoping to live the American dream. He wanted to be a Cuban dancer. He wanted to teach Cuban dancing, but he needed to make ends meet. So he'd taken a job as a part-time caretaker. And also he was a cook at the shelter. So they connect and they begin this two year relationship. And it doesn't take long. Lopez, shall we say, sticks to type and she gets pregnant again which is massively unnecessary because at the end of the day, there's protection. I mean, I know it's both sides. Use a condom if you're a guy because you've got a level of protection there, but you don't have to get pregnant. It happens, but on the whole, it's pretty easy to stave off pregnancy if you are looking after your sexual behavior. But again, why would she get pregnant? Probably to tie herself to this man. Now, as far as Gustavo is concerned, she's clean. She isn't using drugs. She's trying to get her life together. He probably has a huge amount of empathy and sympathy for her, but that's all BS because she's still using crack cocaine and she continues to use crack cocaine throughout her pregnancy. Can somebody immediately remove this woman and sterilize her? Honestly, can you imagine what kind of mindset you have to have where you knowingly put your unborn baby at such high risk. Crack cocaine is incredibly dangerous at any point, but when you are pregnant, you are immediately affecting the safety and well-being of your unborn child. And she's hiding it, so she absolutely knows it's not acceptable, and she's trying to keep it from Gustavo because she's perpetuating an image of a parent that she isn't and she wants him to believe because now she's pregnant with his child that he has this good opinion of her parenting potential and essentially in the background what we see is she's just playing out more of this destructive behavior that has previously afflicted the whole of the family's life now when gustavo finds out about the drug habit he's like absolutely no way this is not even in my universe of acceptance, and he ends the relationship. So we're immediately seeing Gustavo and the type of human being that he is. He's got morals, he's got boundaries, he's got ethics, and he also knows what is acceptable versus unacceptable when it comes to treating your body that is carrying a child. Now, ultimately, social services intervene, 
and they actually remove Lopez's two children from her custody in January 1989 and they are then placed in the care of other family members. She was actually advised by them correctly that she would be able to regain custody as long as she kicked the drug habit and as long as there was evidence that she got her life back on track. So at this point, we would say child protection services are certainly being aware of the need to protect. And that's the right guidance is the right action and also it's the suitable advice given to her if she wants to regain custody of those children now a month later this is on the 11th of february 1989 lopez gives birth to elisa itquiado and immediately we all are aware that being born to somebody like lopez the deck is stacked against you so Elisa is born into this world where she already is way behind the starting blocks, essentially. And she was referred to as a crack baby when she was born because she was born addicted to the drug based on her mother's incredibly selfish habit. Now, unsurprisingly, at this point, given Lopez's history, she loses custody of the newborn, as she should. And her father, Gustavo, is awarded full custody. And that is literally the best thing that could have ever happened to Elisa and it's the one time in her really short life that the system does not spectacularly fail her because if the world was fair if justice prevailed when it should prevail that's where this story should end that Elisa is sent to live with her father and she's loved and cherished and thrives because Gustavo is a really special man he's 34 at the time that he gets custody of her he'd never had any kids before he had no idea what being a parent entailed but he was absolutely devoted he literally dedicated his life to Elisa he took parenting classes he read books on parenting he took advice from family members and friends he wanted to get everything right he proved to be an absolutely amazing dad. He loved Elisa absolutely beyond measure. He doted on her. He was known to refer to her constantly as princess. And for those of you who've had great relationships with your dad, you'll know that there is something so affirming and reinforcing about them using language like that. In a world where often we feel invisible, our dads can give us a sense of visibility often like no other. And without a doubt, that's her foundations beginning to thrive because of that man. He was known to dress her in beautiful dresses and he braided her hair every day. So he would go out of his way to really try to give her that opportunity to feel that even though she didn't have a mother present, that he was doing that work that is usually stereotypical with the female, i.e., you know, plaiting hair, putting bunches in, etc. Although with respect, it was my dad who always did my bunches. They were also very perfect. I also got very head sore because they were so perfect. But he wasn't as good at cutting fringes. One day I'll have to put some pictures of me on this channel after my dad had cut my fringe. Let's just say, for a very perfectionist man, he wasn't very good at cutting a straight line. Straight up like that. Anyway, I digress. What I'm saying is, you can see Gustavo is just like this really proud dad. He's somebody who just doted on her and wanted everybody to know that she was his little girl. And he would keep loads of pictures of her in his wallet. He even rented a banquet hall because he wanted to celebrate her baptism. And you won't be surprised that under his care, Lisa just blossomed, absolutely blossomed. I mean, in a whole range of ways. So she was enrolled in preschool and even there she was showing really great potential. People thought that she was really bright, that she was intelligent for her age, but also there was something just universally loved about her. Teachers, students, they all agreed that she just had one of those personalities that you warmed to. And they said that she was adored. That's the word, that she was adored. People described her as radiant. And I think that's just such a beautiful word because children 
are the best beings in the world as far as I'm concerned. You know, children, then dogs and cats. But at the end of the day, there is just something so beautiful, innocent, naive, funny, free. All of those words are really things that I associate with childhood. But radiant just additionalizes that description, doesn't it? It's like she shines. And I think that that's what people were getting across. There was just something so incredible about who she was that she shined. And that is something that sticks with me because I often think that in a world where jealousy and envy is rife, when somebody shines, it can go one of two ways. People can genuinely lift that up and raise it higher and just be in awe of it and love and enjoy the experience of being around it even. But I think if you're malevolent, I think if you're dark, the shine and radiance of another human being can threaten you. It can even disgust you because it's something you're so incapable of. And I do wonder whether that description of radiance is why her mother just distorts her and destroys her so deeply because it's something that she could never ever have connected with. It's something she isn't capable of. Now, one of the things that occurs in Elisa's childhood is there is a custodian of the preschool and that custodian is none other than Prince Michael of Greece. So on a visit in 1992, he actually requested that one student stayed by his side as a guide. Now, apparently when he arrives, we've got a three-year-old Elisa, so she's only a little dot. She just runs up to him and just throws herself into his arms and allegedly the pair were totally inseparable for the rest of the day. Now, in parallel with this, Gustavo's actually in really poor health, so even though he's been this doting, loving father, he's really struggling. And he's struggling financially, he's struggling to pay the preschool fees. But Prince Michael was so charmed by this delightful little girl that she captivates him. And he offers to pay her fees at the prestigious private Brooklyn Friends School until she reaches college. Can you imagine that? All of the stress and strain and fear just removed in a heartbeat by this generous man. Now, Elisa passes the screening test with absolute flying colours. And Prince Michael doesn't leave it there. He carries on being in touch with her. He wants to know how Elisa's doing, how her father's doing. And he'd send her little gifts from time to time. And Elisa would always respond with a thank you note or a drawing. And it seems that... Despite Elisa's really awful start in life, her future looks bright. But this isn't going to be the fairy tale. This isn't going to be a situation where people live happily ever after, even though they all deserve to. And this future that looks bright, well, it's not going to last very much longer. Now, whilst all this is going on in Elisa's life, apparently, I say the words apparently for a very good reason, in the interim, Lopez has apparently got her life back on track. Mm, really? Just going to think about the fact that she did manage to hide her drug abuse during pregnancy from the man that she was having a child with. Mm, do I believe that this woman is actually going to have her life back on track? It's going to be a big N-O in my mindset. Just throwing it out sounds a little bit judgy and stereotypical to some degree, but I think that's for good reason. Now, according to a social worker, I'm going to put that in brackets, a social worker, because let's be very clear, I don't think that there was a lot of social work going on in this case. Allegedly, she'd got into rehab and she'd kicked the drugs. Also, she'd found herself a new husband. Not very surprising. This woman is constantly looking for men. This guy's called Carlos Lopez, and she marries him in November 1991. Now, I cannot quite describe how incontextual this next comment will be in regards to the actual person that he really is. But according to the reports, he was apparently a gentle and understanding individual. He was a stabilizing influence in her life. I mean, genuinely, I feel when people have such detractions from reality and when they are not in keeping with the past and when there is not words for caution, which I think are really important in reports, it probably should be taken a pinch of salt. 
At the end of the day, everyone wants to believe in hope. Everyone wants to believe that it's possible to change. People do. Absolutely they do. You know, you can get people who've been at AA for 35 years because 35 years earlier their life was a mess and they've never touched another drink, etc. Same with Narcotics Anonymous. This happens. But when a social worker is writing a report, first of all, subjective. To say that somebody is gentle and understanding, why were you having sex with him? Because it seems very intimate, that description. Were you living with him? Because it seems a little bit personal. You're not meant to really put those kind of things in because it creates a bias for the person reading the report, which can lead to some pretty big decisions being made that maybe shouldn't be made. And also, if you say things like gentle and understanding, that certainly is a subjective experience that you would expect comes from a personal connection. That's not what we would see in these scenarios looking in because we don't spend enough time with those individuals. It's a hearsay perspective and position. And also you should always have a word of caution. This person in the past has had A, B and C whilst their life seems to be back on track. There are concerns about A, B and C. It can't just be a wipeout. Oh, everything's fine now. You know, the fairy of magic futures has arrived and sprinkled dust all over them. Everything's going to be fine now. So I already have real issues with the way this is being described. They go on to have two more children together because that's, of course, what you want to do when you've already had such issues in the past with kids. Just have some more. What could possibly go wrong? And they end up with this newer home. So they've got this apartment in Rutgers House, which is a housing project in Lower Manhattan. Now, at this point, she starts the process of getting her custody of her eldest children. And after this, she then applies for unsupervised visitation rights with Elisa in 1991. Apparently, a social worker visited a home and was satisfied with its cleanliness. I kid you not. The amount of emphasis placed on the way homes look is bonkers. Genuinely, it's the same in mental health. If you are mentally ill, but when you go to your appointments, you look like you're dressed well, they're like, oh, well, they're dressed well. They can't really be in crisis. It is completely unsubstantiated, that reality and connection, and actually means that people make catastrophic mistakes. But it appears, oh, if it looks good, it must be good. And it's the same with the amount of emphasis placed on cleanliness. Like, a lot of you watching now will have children, and you'll probably think at times you live in a house where you're secretly a hoarder, because we have so much stuff. And it's not actually that tidy because there is so much stuff and our kids are our priority. So we're not really thinking about everything being in place. The idea that that would make you seem less of a contender of a parent than somebody whose house looks immaculate. In fact, believe me, if I walk into a home where there are children and it's really clean, I'm like, what are you actually doing with your kids? You know, where is the mess? Where is the destruction? Children who are happy, they make a lot of mess. Yes, you clean it up sometimes at the end of the day, but we expect it. But the cleanliness, of course, seems to support this idea that somehow she's totally reformed. And also they say that she's basically looking after her kids adequately. And in spite of the fact that we have seen so many red flags in her prior experience, incredibly, she's just granted immediate unsupervised contact with Lisa. Why? Number one, there's no relationship there. Let's think about the child. The needs of the child are paramount. It's going to be really weird for Elisa. You know, even if she was going to the most loving home in the world with a mother who adored her and regretted all of the things that she'd done in the past, with respect, it's going to take Elisa some adaption time. And that's really important. When you are securely attached to a parent and then you are torn from that parent and given to somebody that you don't know, that is going to impact on your sense of security. You're too young to understand why this is playing out. But it's even worse than that because I suppose we could say, well, worst case scenario, over time, she's hopefully going to figure out a relationship with her mother and realise that she is loved by two people and two parties. But it's not going to be that way because, of course, Lopez is a massive manipulator and a huge liar and she isn't off drugs at all. She's never really cleaned herself up. So her crack habit is way on straight away. Back with a vengeance, simple as that. And she's becoming more and more violent, more erratic, more volatile, to be honest, than ever before. 
So Elisa is going into the worst circumstances any of us could ever imagine. And even worse than that, you know, Carlos, the gentle and understanding, he's gentle and understanding. In the three minutes that I saw them together, he was gentle and understanding. Yeah, he wasn't. Nor was he a stabilising influence that had been painted to be. He was a dangerous, violent bastard. And he was violent to both Lopez and to her children. So she's in an environment where she's high on drugs, disconnected from her kids, getting beaten by the guy that she's with. But at the end of the day, they think that Elisa should just be dropped in there because it's going to be perfect circumstances. Now, on one of the occasions, this is where Elisa is actually visiting on a weekend visit, he accuses Lopez of being unfaithful. And the way that he responds to that accusation is that he stabs her 17 times with a pocket knife. He was subsequently sent to prison for two months. Doesn't sound long enough, I'm going to be honest with you. And this is probably going to sound nasty, and I'm just going to own that it probably does come from a place of anger from me, but Lopez sadly survives. I know that domestic abuse is completely completely unacceptable but all I'm saying is that if she had happened to have been killed in that situation I would not be telling the story and I know I don't get to play God and pick who gets to live but if I had to it wouldn't be her it would be Elisa without a doubt I'm not trying to make light of the domestic violence but some people are just better off not being here and by God she is one such person now, you won't be surprised to hear that Elisa's behaviour just goes absolutely off the wall following the visits to her mother's home because this is happening now every other weekend and apparently the change was dramatic and it was instant. Now, from a social care perspective, if a child's behaviour when they are being taken to another place is so dramatic and so instant that everyone is noticing, you have to acknowledge there is something dire occurring. Children tend to be relatively resilient. There is an overarching theme that children just bounce back that is incorrect. We've all been kids. We all know how wrong people got that when they were like, oh, she lost her dad last night, but it's fine. She's in school today and she's just getting on with it. Kids are just resilient. No, kids are just massively overwhelmed. Their brain can't compute the horror of what they're enduring. So they just function, but they're actually in distress. But I digress again. It's just a bit of a bugbear because I don't think people understand how child development works a lot of the time. And I certainly don't think that they understand that children aren't actually that resilient. They just don't really have a lot of choices in their life. But when you do see something that is really significant, it should spark your attention immediately because there is a common denominator. What has changed in this child's life? Okay, she's visiting the mother and every time she does, there are catastrophic impacts on her behaviour. Right, we need to look at that issue. What is happening in that home? But no one does, really. And even when they're told to, and no one does. Bear in mind, we've described the way that Elisa is in the past. You know, she's vibrant, she's happy, she's radiant. Not anymore. When she came back from her mother's place, she was quiet, she was withdrawn, and equally alarming, if not more so, is that she comes home with bruises. So she was literally bruised all over her body. And following the visits, also she'd vomit and she would literally refuse to walk into the bathroom. Now, when I talk about child protection and red flags, if a child who has previously been quite happy to go into a bathroom starts to develop a fear of a bathroom, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on in that bathroom when they're elsewhere? How are they associating this with something dangerous or negative? And that's going to spark ideas of potential abuse and also potential types of abuse that we're looking at, like sexual, for example. And her dad, he gets it. He's like, I think Lopez is abusing her. Also, Elisa starts screaming in the night. She just wake up and she starts to urinate and defecate uncontrollably. Massive, massive red flag. A child who has previously been dry and has not had issues with going to the bathroom, suddenly urinating and defecating. What is happening 
to the anus area, to the vagina area that is causing these kind of issues. And her dad notices that she's got cuts and bruises on her vagina. And also the teachers at school, they start to get really worried. They can see that something's incredibly wrong. And they, along with Gustavo, report their concerns to Child Protective Services. They're like, there is something really wrong happening in this child's life. But on top of that direct reporting, yes, direct, that's the father and the school saying, hang on, something is seriously wrong here. They also call the child abuse hotline. They are desperate to try to find a way for Elisa to get the help that she needs. And Elisa, she actually goes one step further when she's spoken to by a social worker. She says, my mum hits me and my mum locks me in a closet. She said, I don't want to visit her. And can you imagine hearing that as an individual in social work? Can you imagine actually having that conversation with a child? Your mother locks you in a closet. Your mother hits you. You don't want to go there. And then thinking about all the prior issues with this woman. I mean, at the end of the day, we're looking at the very best outcome being highly supervised contact where they are watched together and mother doesn't have an opportunity to carry out this kind of abuse. Or you're thinking, let's just withdraw any opportunity of this woman to be violent towards her. But in spite of this, when a child welfare worker calls at Lopez's home, they find nothing amiss. I do wonder, did they just knock on the wrong door? Was it possible that they just didn't go at all? Maybe they just sat on the bum doing nothing and just writing up some report talking about how everybody was gentle and understanding. I don't know, just throwing it out there. Now, this basically is where we can only describe future events as a start of a system designed to protect vulnerable children completely failing Elisa. I'm genuinely not convinced that this system at this point was there to protect anyone apart from the wages of the people being paid to do jobs that they clearly weren't doing. Now obviously we have her father horrified. Gustavo is terrified about the change in his daughter. He can see that there is something ultimately going horribly wrong. So he actually applies to have Lopez's visitation rights revoked. But rather than immediately ceasing these contact visits, which they should have because they had enough evidence both verbally from the child, from the school, from the father, and also the injuries to the body to mean that they didn't ever have to see each other again. Instead, the courts allowed that unsupervised contact to continue. But there was a caveat. You can see your daughter, just stop hitting her. Oh my God, I kid you not, that was the guidance. You have to stop hitting your daughter. You can see your child. Oh, thanks, brilliant, because I'm really abusive to my child. Oh, that's the only caveat. You're gonna have to stop hitting her. What about the closet? Haven't mentioned the closet, just don't hit her. Just maybe just use the closet sometimes, or I don't know, use some other means or force to abuse the child, because we're only gonna say, just don't hit her. How crap is it? that we're describing that kind of guidance coming from individuals who are meant to think that the needs and wishes of a child are paramount and the protection of a child is more important than anything else. Now, we also have, remember, Lopez's two eldest children. So they actually lived with her at the same time. And so they're witnessing some of these things and they genuinely spoke to relatives and said that when Elisa was present, both Lopez and her partner, Carlos, were continually physically and verbally abusing her. And this information is being passed on to other adults. What is happening here? Like if I genuinely was told by a child of somebody, oh, by the way, my half sister is being abused perpetually at the house. I swear to God, I would knock the door of that house down, take on the adults, remove the child forcibly. And I tell you what, the wrath of a woman in such a circumstance is not one to be underestimated because my God, it is your duty, it is your ward in life to protect these children. And the idea that so many people know and are doing nothing, it is blind siding and shame on them, shame on them. Elisa, of course, is having to deal with this horrific abuse. She's arriving home injured. 
she's arriving home completely traumatized and it's unbelievable that things are even going to get worse. I mean, it's horrendous that I have to tell this story as it's just a decline, a decline, a decline into where we end up. So in 1993, we find Gustavo doing what I would say is a very sensible thing. He's like, I'm not staying here. The system is geared against my daughter. They are damaging my child. No one is on our side. So he thinks to himself, I'm going to get away. I'm going to relocate to Cuba. He wants to get Elisa away from Lopez. He wants to start a new life. And my God, we all want that for them. But fate intervenes. And in May 1994, he's been struggling with his breathing and he ends up getting diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. He was a heavy smoker, I suppose that could have been a contributing factor, but a lot of people get cancer young and at the end of the day, this is a guy who deserves so much more. And he knew after his diagnosis that he wasn't going to be around for a very long time. He was absolutely desperate to prevent Lopez getting her hands on his daughter. He knew that something terrible could happen if that played out. So he actually makes arrangements for Elsa Canizares, which is his cousin back home in Cuba, to take custody of his daughter. He even goes ahead and buys plane tickets for them. That's on the 26th of May, 1994. But tragically, Gustavo's condition just starts to deteriorate. And on the day, and I mean literally the day that Elisa should have flown to safety, her father died. He was aged just 39. It's so tragic. You know, they say about, they take the good young, and in this case, they certainly did. Gustavo is a very, very special man. And I can't even begin to comprehend how his final moments would have been because he knew. He knew that there was a steam train coming down the tracks that Elisa was tied to if she was gonna be returned to the custody of her horrific, horrendous, disgraceful, disgusting mother. Now the minute that that excuse for a being learns that Gustavo's died, she just goes full bore, applies for custody of Elisa, and everyone who knows Elisa and loves Elisa is absolutely terrified. So when the relatives and when the teachers, they hear about the fact that Elisa's mother has these intentions, they are all horrified. I mean, the school that Elisa goes to is horrified. This is not just people within her mainframe family who are absolutely distressed by this. Literally, those teaching her on a day-to-day -day basis who've seen the decline are like, this would be the worst thing in the world. So they immediately express grave concerns to the court. They say that Lopez has been abusing Elisa, but genuinely, bear in mind the fact they have been and reported all of this fear to the hotline. They've spoken to social workers. We've had social worker actually speak to Elisa herself and confirm the abuse. Not a single one of their previous abuse reports had been substantiated by Child Protective services so none of them have been upheld none of them because i don't know whoever was dealing with it was incredibly lazy because there is no way that they should not have been substantiated by child protective services but because of this the way that the legislation was back then you couldn't use any of it as evidence against lopez's custody application so gustavo's cousin elsa she makes a counterclaim for custody because this is in line with gustavo's last wishes the head of Elisa's school literally personally contacted court supporting Elsa's application and detailing all of the signs of abuse that had been seen. Oh my God, even Prince Michael personally wrote to the court and he's expressing this concern about Lopez gaining custody. But in spite of literally a prince, the head principal of his school, the whole family that Elisa had who'd nurtured her through the years, all saying this would be the worst thing that could happen in the world, every single one of their attempts at bringing ration into the system proved fruitless. It just conspires against Elisa. I cannot believe that you can have all of these parties, all of these officials, all of these professionals stating a case against her going to a mother and yet the system says ah well 
at the end of the day, she's going home. Because if that level of intervention, if that level of resistance to a potential idea, i.e. her going back to her mother, is rejected, when you've had a prince and a school and a child even saying that there was a problem, how is anybody else ever going to get anybody to listen? Because this demonstrates the bar expected and even that fails and it gets worse. So on the day of the hearing, Elsa turns up to court. Bear in mind, she hasn't got a lot of means, so she cannot afford representation. It's really, really expensive. But Lopez, this former crack cocaine addict with a history of child neglect, with multiple reports of child abuse against her name, she just arrives at court and she is represented by everyone. So she's got a legal aid lawyer, totally free. She's got a social worker who, I don't know, maybe wrote about how gentle and understanding her ex-abusive stabbed you 18 times with a penknife guy was. I don't know, but it sounds like this is the same kind of mentality, the woman who comes and supports her. And also there's a representative from Project Chance, which is this federally funded parenting program for the poor. So she has utilised every opportunity to ensure that she is given the best fight possible. She's got this small army on her side. And what a side are they on? A side of disgrace, a side of abuse, a side of lies. But that's where they are. That's where they had staked their claim. Now, according to Elsa, Lopez's hideous lawyer, they start by expressing this incredulity at the nerve that she has to try and take Elisa away from her biological mother, the biological mother who had her born addicted to crack, who literally abuses her day in and day out, who marks her body perpetually and all services, aside from the ones who are meant to actually make a difference to her life, have actually claimed and witnessed this and put it forward to social care, but it doesn't bother any of them because this person is just about winning how do I win for my client not concerned at all about Elisa not concerned at all it's just about winning also they lie say that Lopez was off the drugs she wasn't also said that she could give Elisa a safe and loving home again it's not true on top of this claim that Elisa had expressed a strong desire to be with her mother absolutely 100% a lie I hope that solicitor who stood in court and lied in that family court situation i hope they are haunted because they are responsible for what happened without a doubt and i know they're not the people whose hands were used to harm this child but they are the people who thought that winning was more important than truth to stand and lie and say that a child wishes to be with a birth mother that the child has vehemently said the opposite about is disgraceful. What a hideous excuse for somebody who should be professionally trained. It's why the legal system is so screwed, because it becomes less about truth, less about innocence and guilt, and far more about ego. Now, despite all the red flags that were huge, the judge, Phoebe Greenbaum, and I'm putting them in there with that name so you know, so everybody should know this person's name. Because in spite of the obvious red flags, in spite of the evidential reality of this case, that person still awards full custody of Elisa to Lopez. And in doing so, she and Lopez's representatives sealed this gorgeous little girl's fate. Be it on their heads, I hope they hang in shame every single day of the week. I hope that little girl haunts every single one of their nightmares if they have a conscience, which they may not have. But if they do, my God, I hope she's present there at every waking moment and every sleeping moment. So now we have this gorgeous little girl in a mother's full-time care. And you know what? It's given her mother permission. She can literally do what she wants. She has done what she wants. She's been abusing this child consistently for a long period of time. And all she's found is support. Why would she change her behaviour? It amplifies. It escalates. Now, Lopez had initially ended the relationship with Carlos after he'd stabbed her. But when he gets released from prison, yeah, she gets back together with him because... Obviously, she's an individual who actually relates to the kind of violence that he's given to her. This is also a woman who is equally, if not more violent than him. 
Lopez's crack cocaine abuse, well, that's intensifying because she's the most selfish piece of rubbish in this universe. Now she's got six children and she's also unemployed. So she's going to be stressed. She's going to be poor. She's going to be looking for her next fix. She's going to be in a situation where she's more violent because of that stress. And she's doing things like even attempting to sell the kids toys for drugs. And at some point, Elisa actually says, where's my dad? And Lopez apparently screamed in her face, your father's dead. What kind of a person could do that to a little girl? But it gets worse because obviously Elisa's mother doesn't like the idea of anyone knowing what's going on behind closed doors. So first off, she removes her from the private school, the private school that Prince Michael's offered to pay and has been paying the fees towards. So this is the perfect place for her where she can thrive. No, it's been taken away. So she removes her and puts her in the public school 126. But that doesn't stop teachers knowing what's wrong. They immediately see it. And bear in mind, listen, at public school 126, there are going to be a lot more kids who are coming from problematic homes. So the fact that immediately when Elisa is moved there, the school teachers are horrified because there is something clearly going wrong in this child's life. It demonstrates just how grave the situation must have been. And these professionals call it out. They can see numerous bruises. She's really withdrawn. She doesn't have any contact with the other kids. And she becomes doubly incontinent at school. Even starts tearing patches of hair out. The agony, the distress that child is enduring on an emotional level is unbearable to imagine. The fact that she's doubly incontinent, the fact that she's pulling out her own hair, it tells its own story. You don't need any qualifications to go, there is something seriously wrong here. What has been the common denominator? Oh, it's her going home to her biological parent that she should never have been within 100 metres of. So the teachers see all this, know all this. They also recognise that she walks in a strange, uneven way. And that obviously shows that there is something going on down below, likely in her private parts. She's obviously in pain. And all of this that's noted is for a good reason. Because Elisa is being systematically abused and tortured by that woman on a daily basis. So she's being regularly kicked and punched by her mother. She's being whipped by a belt. They also like to burn cigarettes all over her body. Elisa would very often be locked in a room and that meant that she didn't have access to the simple amenities like a bathroom. So they would leave her with a chamber pot, but they wouldn't clean it. So then it would overflow and it overflowed to the point where it was actually leaking into the apartment below. And at that point, obviously, it's going to be a problem because people are going to recognize this. So then she starts using her own bed as a toilet, the place that should give her sanctuary and rest. And it's being used for these purposes. We've got Lopez then forcing her to eat her own feces. Then she uses Elisa's face and hair to mop the floor. I mean, this is somebody who is thinking again and again, how do I make this worse? How do I make this worse for this child? How do I hurt her more? How can I make this despicable and disgraceful experience for this child even more despicable and disgraceful? She even did things like crushed her fingers and toes beneath her chest of drawers. She hung her from a shower wad because she used to enjoy watching it. She took her hands and placed them on a hot stove. Now, it's around the time that all this horrific abuse is playing out that she actually gets admitted to hospital with a fractured shoulder. When the doctors looked at it, it transpired that she hadn't had that treated for at least three days. Can you imagine having a fractured shoulder and probably enduring the kind of abuse I've just talked about and there being a three-day gap between getting any treatment? I also think, what were the doctors thinking when they actually got that little girl in? A fractured shoulder is an unusual injury for a child, but there were other things going on on her body. Where is the child protection being entered at this point? It just feels like Every service was just weighted against this little girl. But this is bad enough, what I've just described. I mean, this is bad enough to make the caregivers have to go to prison forever, in my opinion. Or maybe, I don't know, just be given a one-way ticket to hell. But it gets worse because 
she's also enduring this horrific sexual abuse. So Lopez, who is a disgraceful, distorted kind of human being, this is the malevolence within this woman's soul. You know, aside from all the stuff I've just said, she's getting a toothbrush and a hairbrush and she's violating Elisa in her private parts, both vaginally and anally with these. That's why she couldn't walk because she's in agony. And what kind of twisted mindset do you have that you are raping your child this way? Because remember, we talk a lot about men, don't we? We talk a lot about guys and the way that they abuse children. But we have to remember that women also do this. And often women do it in a more manipulative way, in a more private way. And the bias of society means that they aren't noted in the same way that men are. The expectation is that, oh, well, if a guy is there, potentially, but if a woman's there, she'd never do it. And Lopez knows this. She's using every trick in the book. She knows. She's already found that the system is totally on her side. So why shouldn't she stop? Why shouldn't she hurt her child this way? Now, even though she has other kids, and yes, she is abusive to the other children, it's minimal in comparison. The vast amount of sadistic torture is reserved solely for Elisa. And the way that she enjoys inflicting that torture at times is to get the other children to sit and watch. They didn't want to. They were traumatised by it. But that's what she enjoyed. She wanted to deride and humiliate and ridicule this little girl whilst physically and sexually abusing her in this manner. Now, as well as this constant physical abuse, there's also this emotional and verbal abuse. Lopez had particular phrases that she would use, but just to state, obviously, these are deeply offensive and it's something that I don't want to even say, but at the same time, it's something that she actually spoke to that child and to just show you the kind of depravity and level of this woman's abuse. She would call Elisa Mongoloid. She called her a dirty little whore. She actually did that in public, openly. People heard that. What were these people thinking? God, if I heard another adult, and you wouldn't have needed to train me in all my years of safeguarding to know this, but if you were witness to somebody calling their little girl or little boy a dirty little whore or any other slur that's indicative of that level of resentment or hate, I swear to God, the best that they could expect would be a visit from the police and social services. I don't even know how I would control myself. And if she's saying that openly in public, what the hell is she saying behind closed doors? She also tells friends that she believes that Elisa had been placed on some kind of voodoo spell by her father, so we can see there, can't we? The resentment playing out. She's fully aware that he was such a better human being than she is. She'll never be capable of being even a cell of that man's body in comparison, goodness-wise. And she probably hates that. She hates that this little girl was so much better than she was too. That's why she wants to destroy her. But this idea that she's possessed by the devil, that's just a permission base, isn't it? Well, if she's possessed by the devil, I just need to beat the devil out of her. She's even claiming to some friends that she slid snakes down Elisa's throat to exorcise the demons. Again, if you are one of her friends and you are hearing this kind of information, you should be withdrawing that child from the home physically immediately. How they listen to this level of sordid abuse being told to them and just accepted it, it blows my mind. So we've got teachers at Elisa's new school. They are absolutely devastated about what they are seeing play out in this child's behaviour. They're reporting their concerns of child abuse to child welfare services. But apparently, I kid you not, the social workers concluded that the case was unreportable due to a lack of evidence. <laughs> oh my God. How is there a lack of evidence? But again, this is the social workers on the side of the mother, inflating the mother's ego, increasing her confidence, enabling that malevolent ego to play out further the abuse that she feels comfortable doing because no one is coming. No one is there for that little girl. Everyone is there for her mother. So how can it be wrong? And Lopez's distorted psyche, she has a right to do what she is doing because even those from Child Protective Services agree 
that she's responsible and acceptable to be bringing up her daughter. Now Lopez, when she finds out the school are trying to help her daughter, does the obvious, removes her daughter from school completely, that's in December 1994. That means that Lisa is now at the mercy of her, the abuser 24-7, and Lopez absolutely embraces it. She locks her in a bedroom 24 hours a day. She's not even allowed to eat. She's not allowed to socialise with the siblings. And that means that there is literally no one to protect her. So, of course, the abuse just intensifies because there is literally nobody to protect that little girl. And unbelievably, and this is really demonstrative of what I was saying earlier on about Lopez and her ego, her self-indulgence, her selfishness. She, in spite of doing all of the things that I've just talked about to this gorgeous little girl, actually goes and complains about Elisa to the representative of Project Challenge. You remember the people who came and helped this bitch get custody of her little girl so she could literally ruin her? Yeah, she goes and complains to them. So she basically says, listen, Elisa's soiling herself. She's cutting her hair off. She's drinking from the toilet. Now, at that point, if you are hearing that, you are going to be like, oh my God, there is something deeply wrong with what's happening either at home or with the child. But either way, this desperately needs to be investigated. So the representative at this point then goes and speaks to Child Welfare Services. But the caseworkers just never follow it up. And I will give it to the person who was a representative who heard those claims because they obviously were deeply concerned with respect and they actually call again and again and again. And in the end, I kid you not, the child welfare services said they were too busy to visit Lopez's home. That literally happened, guys. You have a professional ringing very concerned about the behaviour of a child. Obviously, at that moment in time, they don't know whether there's something going on with the child themselves or whether it is to do with the environment, but they are that concerned that they are ringing repeatedly. And instead of Child Protective Services going, OK, we'll go and get it sorted, they're like, no, we are too busy to actually do our jobs. And that was a final opportunity that they had, a final opportunity to save Elisa and they missed it. And they didn't miss it by mistake, they missed it by choice. We get to the 22nd of November, 1995. At this point, Lopez gives her sister a call. Her sister's called Mercy Torres. And she tells her sister that Elisa was, quote, like retarded on the bed, just lying there drooling. Now, later, Lopez goes and admits that two days earlier, she'd literally slammed Elisa's head into a concrete wall. And then since then, she hadn't apparently been responsive. And Lopez had seen this. She'd created this situation. Did she call emergency services? Did she ask for help? Absolutely not. She just left to lay there. So she didn't get any medical help and intervention whatsoever. Then Lopez said that she'd noticed that fluid was coming out of Elisa's nose and mouth. And it was, but it wasn't mucus, it wasn't saliva, it was brain fluid. It was brain fluid. Mercy is horrified and she says to Lopez, look, take it to the hospital. She said that she'd look after the other kids. And Lopez said that she may think about it after she had finished the dishes. Now, again, I don't know what Mercy was thinking in that moment, just pick up the phone and dial emergency services but no she just lets that slide in spite of the fact that she knows something ultimately terrible has played out then the next morning lopez goes and speaks to a neighbor and says look can you just come and take a look at elisa when that neighbor walks in instantly they know something terrible's happened elisa's cold she's not breathing the neighbor says to Lopez, look, you need to call emergency services right away. And she just refuses. He ends up pleading with her for the next two hours. Finally, the neighbor just says, listen, I'm gonna call emergency services myself. And in response to that, what does Lopez do? She climbs on the roof and says that she's gonna throw herself off. Now, when the police arrive at the property, because that neighbor does actually call emergency services, they were unfortunately able to persuade Lopez to climb down from the roof. I swear to God, it's a shame that one of those officers didn't go up there and just accidentally dislodge her 
from said height. Genuinely, the world would be a better place. The emergency responders, they actually arrived like within a few minutes. It's apartment 20A. Obviously, when there is a child that looks like they may be deceased or dying, they're going to be there fast and they are horrified. Elisa's physical state is immediately a cause for concern because, yeah, she's unresponsive, so she's not breathing. But what they notice is her body is literally covered in welts, in burns, in bruises. Fireman actually says he's going to have a go at CPR. So he does. He attempts that CPR, but it's absolutely hopeless. She's pronounced dead shortly after. At this point, Lopez is obviously arrested. She's taken his custody because it's obvious that she's the one who's been doing it. And as she is being led to the police car, bear in mind, let's just put yourselves into the mindset of a mother whose baby has just been found dead. Let's just place yourself in a position of horror, trauma, fear, devastation, grief, all in that moment, shock, because you've just realized that your child is dead. You are gonna be hysterical for your child. The last person you are gonna be thinking about is yourself and your own needs. You are secondary to that situation, you do not care. All you care about is what the hell has happened to your child. But as she's led to the patrol car, she is screaming, I didn't do it. Because actually, the only person that matters in this not right excuse for a human's life is herself. When they are able to establish what happened to Elisa, they say that this little six-year-old girl had basically died from a blunt force trauma injury to the head. It had caused a massive hemorrhage but the injuries all over her body were just horrendous so she was covered in head to toe in bruises this included around her face around her temples there were loads of small circular marks that covered her body and they were actually able to discover that that was a ring so there was a stone in a ring that Lopez had and that was what was causing the indentations Several of her fingers were broken, that's right, several, so nearly all of them, and the bone of her little finger on her right hand was literally protruding through the skin. Also, there was a broken toe. Her face was literally covered in burns. Her body was covered in burns. When they looked internally, she had so much damage to her internal organs. She'd also suffered severe trauma to her genitalia. It had been torn. Also, her rectum had been torn. So this girl was from head to toe in every area. Every element of her physiology had been damaged by a woman who was meant to be taking care of her. And tragically, how many opportunities had there actually been to save Elisa? So, first of all, let's just forget all of the ones that we've talked about. What about the neighbours? Because... When they interviewed the neighbours, apparently they'd heard constant abuse. They'd listened to Elisa begging, Mommy, please stop, no more, I'm sorry. Again, I heard that in one of my neighbours' homes. They better hope their door was open because I'm going to be coming through it, whether it is or otherwise. The idea of hearing a little child beg, Mommy, please stop, no more, you are going to bet your bottom dollar there is going to be a serious reaction. But no. And actually, they said that when the screams became too loud, basically Lopez had just turned the radio up. Not a single neighbour had actually reported those concerns. In fact, one of the neighbours went so far as to justify it and said, oh, well, you know, you know, corporal punishment was legal. So at the time it was legal to hit your children and lots of parents did. I was a child brought up in an environment where it was kind of dying out, that behaviour. But certainly when I was a child, a lot of my friends and certainly myself got the occasional slap. But what we're talking about there is a legitimization of abuse. You know, these days we know a lot more. We gain a lot more from our understanding. We've seen the damage that these kind of things can do to children. Don't hit kids. It's a very simple solution. Evidence says that if you don't hit kids, you'll get a better outcome than if you do hit kids. And I know that somebody listening will be like, well, I got hit and it was fine. I get that. I absolutely get that. But it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have been finer if you hadn't been hit. And that's the dichotomy. You have to think, well, what will do the least harm and actually not being physically abusive to a child, even a little slap can be problematic. It doesn't teach the child anything apart from, oh my God, what's that slap? You focus on the actual slap, not the behavior that needs to change. 
anyway, that's something I digress on there. It's just, it's one of those things that really gets me. I've worked many years with children, many years in parenting and trying to help people to understand that there are better ways compassionately to bring up children. But back then, they were hitting kids in school. You know, it was as simple as that. There was a massive legitimization of abuse in our society. But there is always a point, and if you are hearing a child screaming and begging, if somebody's turning up the music to disguise the agony, come on, pick up the phone. But basically this neighbour who excused themselves from what had happened said that hey, it's just the way that Lopez disciplined her children. What? A bit like when her partner stabbed her 18 times. Is she just like, you know, having a bit of an argument and taking it a little bit physical, but at the end of the day, you know, it's only a bit of domestic abuse. He also claimed, this particular neighbour, that lots of other parents did similar. What a place to live. What a time to live. Anyway, we get to the 29th of November 1995. Elisa's funeral takes place. It was just two months before her seventh birthday. Can you imagine what that child had been through? Not even seven years. She'd been so horrifically abused by her mother. Her father had died. She'd lost the opportunities that had been provided for her. And now her final moment is at her funeral 400 mourners turned up and actually most of those mourners had never even met elisa but they were absolutely touched by the horrific story that they'd heard they wanted to pay the respects they actually gave her an open casket and i think that they wanted people to see her innocence to see her naivety to see this beautiful child that was stolen and that's why they had the open casket they had put clothes on her also they'd done a job where makeup covered a lot of her injuries, but people who were looking into that casket could still see several because they were still visible across her face. And the Reverend says something so powerful, honestly. You know when somebody writes something and it's not just playing lip service, it's not just about creating an emotional response, it's about quiet rage. And I think that the Reverend had a quiet rage within him. He said, Elisa was not killed only by the hand of a sick individual, but by the impotence of silence of many, by the neglect of child welfare institutions and the moral mediocrity that has intoxicated our neighbourhoods. What a powerful statement. I mean, he sums that up far better than I ever could. But the reality of the silence, you're all responsible. The services, you're responsible the apathy, they're all responsible. So powerful coming from somebody like him. Now, it, it was obvious when they were looking at this case that Elisa had been subjected to prolonged and sustained abuse. And the police wanted to question her on this because they could see there were the hallmarks of systemic abuse for a long period of time. But during the police interview, when you would imagine that Lopez would ideally be moved because her child is dead, and the reality of the actions that she has actually bestowed on that child have come to fruition and now she's facing the consequences, she just is completely emotionless. At the end of the day, she just kind of goes through the motions. But she does tell the police some unbelievably disturbing things. So she admits that she hit Elisa so hard that she'd flown headfirst into a concrete wall. And she said after that she didn't walk or talk. And then she went on to say that she actually waited two days after that before going to the neighbour for help. She also admits that she made her daughter eat her own faeces. She also admitted that she held her upside down using her hair to mop the floor. I mean, you can't quite compute where the investigators' minds would be in those moments. I mean, they're listening to something so diabolical and reprehensible and left field that it must almost feel like you're having an out-of-body experience. And they're obviously having to be pleasant to her because that's what you have to do when you're interrogating people. You want them to feel at ease telling you what you need to be told so that you can get any kind of conviction. But it must have been grueling for them to listen. Now, after they've gained all this information, obviously they have a right to charge her and Lopez is charged with first-degree murder, as she should be. This woman should never walk the streets again under any circumstances in any universe even if there's a universe that we one day can send these kind of people to by themselves with a very poor atmosphere even then 
She shouldn't get a chance to even go in there as an experiment for Elon Musk. But even though she's charged with first degree murder and she's culpable and guilty of it, she decides that she's going to plead not guilty. Now, if you plead not guilty, you guys all know that means that the kids who witnessed all of this, they are going to be brought into court and they are going to have to be witness and bear testimony to the situation they saw play out. With respect, I have to say, I think that even though that's an awful situation, my God, they have been through far worse. Why not put them on a stand? However, prior to the trial, she gets offered a plea deal, which blows my mind. And I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. If this had been a man who had sexually violated, raped with an object and murdered a child after systemic abuse for a long period of time. Do you think they would have offered him a plea deal? No, they would not. He would have been on that stand. He would have been considered an absolute monster and he would have got life without parole or the death sentence. That's what would have happened every day of the week. Don't need to know any more than I know about crime and the reality of sentencing to know that there would be a disparity between a female and a male in the situation. And she gets a plea deal. She gets to plead to second degree murder in June 1996. And even though she's 29 years of age at the time, which you would think, well, that's a long time in prison, right? With a first degree plea, 29, you're going to have like possibly 60 years inside yeah you know good you deserve it no because of the plea deal at 29 she gets sentenced to 15 years to life in prison i appreciate there's the to life but my god the fact that 15 years even comes in to this sentence it blows my mind it blows my mind because let's just go for low bar you know let's just go for low bar she'd be 44 if she was given parole at that point i mean you know you're still young enough to have kids you're still young enough to have a whole life ahead of you, even though you've stolen a life of a little girl that you subjected to the most agonizing situations for a long period of time. You stole that child's life, but you're going to get another one. But this plea deal allows that. Now, what is even more upsetting, and this leaves me incandescent with rage, and I know why you guys asked me to cover this case, I really do, because I know that you will feel that justice wasn't done. So, during the court proceedings, social workers who should be hung out to dry in this case, they actually used the laws that had failed Elisa to cover their own failings. So when they were asked to describe what action, if any, had been taken during the numerous consistent reports of abuse, they refused to answer it. They used confidentiality laws and were like, oh, I can't talk about a client in that way. What cowards, what gutless unprofessional, child abuse supporting cowards. I know this is not representative of the average person who works in this field, but my God, who are these inhumane professionals who did everything to contribute to the murder of this child? Also in court, Lopez's partner is tried, rightfully so, Carlos Lopez, and he gets sentenced to one and a half to three years in prison. What? Apparently, they could only try him for one instance of physical abuse against Elisa. This is apparently when he repeatedly banged her head into a concrete wall, and that gets you what? One and a half to three years in prison? I mean, where are the consequences for these individuals? But the other thing is that he did miles more abuse. You know, the siblings of Elisa had actually said he was abusing her constantly, He'd abused her many more times than once. But again, she's failed, even at a time when those perpetrators who harmed her so deeply should have been brought to justice. Now, since her incarceration, Lopez has given interviews. Of course she has. Of course she has. Lopez is going to be a narcissist who is ego-driven. Give her a camera, give her an opportunity to speak. She's going to come out with all the BS in the world. And she actually, during those interviews, has claimed that she never seriously abused or tortured Elisa. And she even adds to that and says, yeah, the only reason that I pled guilty to second-degree murder is because I needed to save my children the trauma of a trial. I mean, what a saint. What a saint. The truth is, she should have been convicted of first degree murder. End of. She should be serving the rest of her life out in prison. 
hopefully being considered the child murderer that she is in very inhospitable circumstances regarding relationships with other offenders who are not going to take to her lightly. But the reality is she wasn't the one making that decision about not dragging the kids through the court. The truth is it was the prosecutors who did not want to drag her children through the ordeal of a trial. That's why they offered the plea deal, which with respect, I disagree with. Honestly, those children, like I said, have already been through. I don't even think these children needed to give any witness testimony. There were so many other witnesses that would have evidenced that this woman was a sustained period of abuse that led to her daughter's death and also the way that she died and neglected to get any help for her. All of this, along with the horrific violations sexually of the child, I would bet every day of the week a jury would find her guilty of first degree murder. But because that didn't get offered, because she wasn't tried for that, it's likely that one day she will get granted parole. When by rights. She should be locked up for good and the only way that she should ever get out of that prison is in a box. It's as simple as. Now her surviving children, every single one of them suffered severe psychological trauma because of the witnessing of that horrific abuse that their mother inflicted on Elisa. And I can imagine that every single one of them wishes that she was in prison forever because they must rue the day of possibility that she's gonna get out. They must be terrified of that possibility. Or I don't know, maybe they're not. Maybe they think within their mindset that if she ever gets out, her life will be so dire and diabolical that she'll be serving a whole sentence in a completely different way. I don't know. I hope they figure a way forward and they learn to thrive because their success is their greatest revenge. The only good thing, and I hate even saying that because I don't really feel there are any victories in what I've described, the only acceptable change, I suppose, to come from this tragic case was that the law changed because the mayor of New York actually was so disturbed and disgusted by this that they appointed a task force to investigate child welfare services. And it was identified that legislation that should have made the child's welfare paramount was actually being used to protect the custody rights of biological parents, regardless of how unsuitable they were. It actually is something that a lot of people who watch this, who work in services, will have been there at a time where we all felt this connection, which is, there were times where certain individuals who were leading services had such privileged mindsets and were so disconnected with the kind of level of malevolence that certain people are capable of that they just would not ultimately accept that biological parents were terrible at times for children and they would go all out to prevent that anybody else who was far better placed to care for these children to have access to those children instead returning them to biological parents who were ultimately tragic in that child's life but there were these individuals who made it so powerfully important with the workers that they were kind of directing, that those workers ultimately felt that their hands were tied. And it was a very difficult time. And it's why we've seen more and more of these cases in the past being brought up. Because when you look at the lessons learned, they didn't happen. And we've seen repetition after repetition after repetition. And it's because of those, like I said, very strange individuals who just couldn't wrap their head around the fact that just because you are biologically linked to somebody does not put you in a better position to raise that child. There are people who should not be allowed anywhere near kids. And they were saying when they reported after this investigation that there were people who were just wholly unsuitable and they were still giving the children back. And also Lopez, she and others clearly had benefited from what they considered was a veil of secrecy. And this veil of secrecy, of course, is actually designed to protect the innocent. And also it's meant to protect the people who are reporting the abuse. So it encourages people to anonymously report the abuse, which makes total sense. But instead of that being the case, it had been used to protect those who were not innocent. So let me put it out there. This is how it worked. If you reported abuse that wasn't then substantiated, i.e., the social worker didn't come out and actually look or didn't interview you correctly and keep notes or didn't add it to the records. Basically, if it wasn't done to a degree where they were like, oh, this has been absolutely verified by this particular person working. If that didn't occur, those records that had actually been kept were expunged. So basically they removed them. 
Didn't matter whether there was 50, 60, 70, 100. They literally got rid of them from the record. So accordingly, when a judge came to make custody arrangements, they had to disregard all of those reports. A thousand wouldn't matter. They'd have to disregard them. In Elisa's case, social workers somehow had come to the conclusion that every report of abuse from the school, from Prince Michael, from the father, from people who knew her, every single one of those was unsubstantiated, yet none of them stood up. So despite all of the alarm bells, all the red flags, the fact that we were sending a girl back to a deranged, violent crack addict, they still awarded custody to her. Now, like I said, there are no good things really about this case, but what resulted was that they created Elisa's Law. So Elisa's Law came into force in February 1996, and that was basically aimed at promoting greater transparency and communication between agencies. So that meant that it would allow them to disclose whether they'd opened an abuse case. Also, it holds child welfare agencies publicly accountable for their actions. So because it allows the public to know details of abuse cases. So it makes it a lot more transparent, which is absolutely integral to child protection. Now, Lopez unbelievably first became eligible for parole in 2010, but thankfully, thankfully, to date, this has not been allowed, this has been denied. Let's just all throw it out there. Hopefully this is a trend that's gonna continue till she dies. I have no qualms in saying that. One of the things that I've read in the press about Elisa is that her life's been compared to a real life Cinderella story. You know, she's born in humble beginnings in a homeless shelter. Initially, she's in the care of a really loving father. And then following his untimely death is taken in by an evil mother figure. And let's be honest, there was actually indeed a real life prince who tried to improve her life. But unlike Cinderella, Elisa was ultimately abused and tortured by the person who should have loved her most. And she was let down by a system that should have protected her. Countless opportunities to save her were missed. For Elisa, there's no happy fairy tale ending. And that is a blight on our humanity. Because every single piece of this story that takes us into the depths of disgusting, despicable human behaviour could have been avoided. Every element of this child's future could have been changed, could have been saved. It was the laziness of the services. It was the apathy of those who saw this child in her locality being abused. It was the abandonment of the nurture and care that a mother should have provided that led to what I've talked about today. And it is something that should stain the consciences of all those who touch this story eternally. I wish only pain on that girl's mother. And it sticks on my tongue to use that word mother because she does not deserve to ever be granted with the privilege of such a name. It means something so distinct to who she is and to what she did. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. You've asked me for it again and again. I hope I've done it justice. I'm so angry. I feel like I'm just telling a story that's been told before and I fear I will tell a story that will be told again. But this is dedicated to Elisa, a life brutally cut short, a hope that existed that was snuffed out. I hope she's flying high, I hope she's in the arms of her father. I know she will be in the arms of her father and I hope she's in eternal bliss whilst her mother is sent to eternal hell. Let me know guys and this is 100% dedicated to Elisa. May you absolutely fly high, sweet girl. Be safe, guys. Take care.